everyone, and welcome to this special edition of the Balancing Act Behind the Mystery. I'm Olga Villaverde. And I'm Montel Williams. Today, two rare diseases, Friedrich's ataxia and peripheral T-cell lymphoma. We'll not only cover these two diseases, but we'll also hear how the patients living with them are making a difference in the lives of many others. The Balancing Act starts right now. Today on Behind the Mystery, Friedrich's ataxia, a progressive and debilitating neurological disorder. Patients can often experience at a young age difficulty walking, clumsiness, and impaired speech. We're going to sit down with neurologist Dr. Susan Perlman to learn more. But first, let's meet patient Frankie Perizzola. I began to notice symptoms when I was in my freshman year of college. I was struggling going up the stairs. I could just feel how much harder it was to put an effort into walking that was previously so easy. That's when it first started to hit me like something was going on. It was getting more and more difficult to bring the groceries up or even just going down in my car. Walking across the stage at our graduation, I was terrified. I was more worried about falling at my graduation than I was about actually graduating. The Balancing Act met with neurologist Dr. Susan Perlman of UCLA Medical Center who treats patients with Friedrich's ataxia. Friedreich's ataxia is a neurodegenerative genetic disorder with mutations in both copies of the FXN gene that makes frataxin protein. Frataxin protein is necessary for the production of energy in highly energy dependent parts of the body, which includes the brain, the nervous system, the heart. So brain cells, especially those that control coordination and balance are weakened, and the heart muscle, which requires a constant supply of energy, is also weakened. Upon graduating college, Frankie began to investigate her symptoms further. It was her godmother and godmother's husband, both in the medical field, that spurred her diagnostic journey. It was definitely noticeable that my gait was off. They gave me the reflex test and I had zero reflexes. And the way they looked at each other when that happened, I just got the feeling something was wrong. That's how I got introduced to a cardiologist and neurologist. The early symptoms are so generic, um, mild clumsiness, not running as fast as the other kids in PE class, um, unexplained stumbles and falls. But when the symptoms have been present for you know, several months, um, usually the family, the school recognizes that there's something wrong. Being the most common cause of genetic ataxia in that age group, the concern about a neurologic problem is thought about either by the pediatrician or by a pediatric neurologist who may be called in to diagnose. Or if somebody presents with an atypical form, they're a little older than the average, um, or they present initially with scoliosis, or rarely they present with heart failure before the ataxia is recognized. I went to the neurologist first, He's the one that initially brought up the word ataxia. He referred me to getting an MRI and CT scan. Looking back on what I know now, I don't think my neurologist understood what I was describing as how he would understand. I was saying I was dizzy but really it was my gait and my vision that was being affected and that was causing me to feel the way I was feeling. So overall, I was maybe in a guessing period of three to four years. The clinical presentation with these key features, gait and limb ataxia, slowed or slurred speech, absence of lower limb reflexes, distal weakness in the hands and feet, 
dizziness, scoliosis, or other skeletal abnormalities. If they meet even half the criteria for classic Friedreichs, adult and pediatric neurologists will feel comfortable ordering the Friedreichs Ataxia GAA expansion test, which looks for enlargement of that segment of the gene that then blocks the production of the frataxin protein. With neurologic problems that are expected to be progressive, early diagnosis, especially an early genetic diagnosis, you can begin to set out a, a health maintenance plan. For Frankie, it took four years of getting multiple opinions and meetings with various neurologists to finally have a genetic test to confirm her diagnosis. On my diagnosis day, I finally met with my neurologist and I had my mom next to me. They slid over a piece of paper with my test results and the first line said, Francesca Perizola has inherited Friedrich's ataxia. Um, it, I had been going through years and years of questioning myself and my body. Overall, I felt grateful that I finally received an answer. As Friedrich's ataxia progresses, there's an increased risk of scoliosis, heart failure, and arrhythmias, diabetes, difficulty swallowing, slurred speech, muscle atrophy, and more. Because of these serious consequences, patients should be diagnosed as early as possible to help optimally manage symptoms. The team is, is key. Regular visits with the neurologist, a general internist or an endocrinologist, cardiologist. The heart is the primary determinant of mortality. Our foundation of management does revolve around rehabilitation medicine. Physical therapy when appropriate, occupational therapy, speech and swallowing therapy. We know that a regular exercise program, proper diet, um, and judicious use of whatever supplements the, the family would like to try can absolutely improve the, un the young person's quality of life. After I received my diagnosis, my mom and I drove home. Um, it was a very emotional drive. I had to relearn the approach I was going to take in life. Four months after my diagnosis, I met Dr. Perlman. She not only was able to address every single question I had about my body and the way FA was going to affect me, but she also had every re resource that I needed. Um, one being FARA, or the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance. I became an ambassador. They would send me out to different doctorate programs, genetic counseling programs, to speak to them and kind of put a face behind FA, as well as raising a little bit of awareness. When a patient has been diagnosed with a rare disease like Friedreich's ataxia. That relationship between the patient, the family, and the physician is key. They need to have an open dialogue. Being able to engage with Frankie and people like Frankie to keep them looking forward. You know, I was so impressed with her willingness to learn and to really face this problem head on. I've just learned that I need to listen to my body and that things are going to be really hard and things are going to be really challenging, but I got it. I can figure it out. For more information on many of the infographics you have seen here today and to find resources to help neurologists diagnose FA and patients to manage FA, visit connectfa.com. You can also visit our website, The Balancing Act, dot com.
approximately 7,000 known rare diseases, but only 5% of them have an approved treatment. For patients, clinical trials are an opportunity to receive promising new therapies. However, the enrollment process can often be overwhelming to navigate. And today, on well, Behind the Mystery, learn how the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society are helping to ease the burden. But first, let's hear from James, a patient advocate and T-cell lymphoma fighter. Take a look. Pathologist said there were too many tumors to count. He stopped counting at 50. When I was uh, finally diagnosed, I started doing a little research and all of the news was terrible. It was rare, it was aggressive. At that point, it was considered incurable. Since 2008, James has had two T-cell lymphomas and MDS. And in 2015, he battled all three at the same time. They were all trying to claim my life. In 12 years, I've relapsed four times. I've been in four clinical trials. I had nine regimens involving so far 20 drugs. I had a stem cell transplant with my son being my donor. Dr. Ajay Gopal, the medical director of clinical research, hematology at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance has more. Lymphomas are unique in that they are a cancer of the immune system, specifically the white blood cells, the lymphocytes, which are key to fighting infections. So the way we classify lymphomas are in two broad groups, non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma. And within the non-Hodgkin lymphoma, there are three major subgroups, the B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the T-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and the NK or natural killer cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Peripheral T-cell lymphoma, also known as PTCL, is one of the many subtypes of T-cell lymphomas that typically arises in lymphoid tissue, so lymph nodes, but also can arise in other sites, uh, skin, lung, gastrointestinal tract, for example. Because of its rarity and because the results generally are not what we would like, it's very important to see a specialist that specializes in treating lymphomas and blood cancers, most commonly at a major referral center or university uh, type setting. Unfortunately, the cure rates with peripheral T-cell lymphoma are low. The majority of individuals will experience recurrence of their lymphoma. We are working uh, to develop new therapies, but the most common approach would include chemotherapy, sometimes a targeted agent, and sometimes stem cell transplant is used. In a disease like peripheral T-cell lymphoma, clinical trials are critically important. Clinical trials not only allow the individual who's participating in the trial to have access to cutting edge therapy, it also helps others with peripheral T-cell lymphoma. This is how all the current therapies that we use were developed for courageous individuals taking part in clinical trials. A clinical trial is a carefully designed research study which tests the benefits and risks of a specific medical treatment or intervention. This could be testing a new drug, a drug combination, or use of an already approved drug for a different disease. However, there can be misconceptions about trials. Clinical trials, importantly, are highly regulated. They are scrutinized by the Food and Drug Administration, by something called an IRB, which is an independent committee which makes sure that they are safe and appropriate for patients, as well as other regulatory committees such as scientific review, etc. To a great degree, the trial is there to evaluate the safety and efficacy of a promising new therapy. And this is where it's important to talk to your doctor who will be hopefully a lymphoma specialist who will understand the pros and cons of an individual trial for you and how it fits in with your care. When my wife made the appointment for me at a national center, we were assigned to a uh, lymphoma specialist. When I was uh, first treated, the standard of care for this lymphoma was not optimal for me, but it was thought to be the best that was available. When I relapsed, he then was able to propose a clinical trial but it worked out very well. Coming up, how the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's Clinical Trial Support Center is helping patients. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. In an effort to help patients find clinical trials, overcome barriers to enrollment, and increase awareness and education for patients and caregivers, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society created a clinical trial support center in 2016. And we met with registered nurse Nina Kennedy, a clinical trial nurse navigator, to learn more. Take a look. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, or LLS, is a global leader in the fight to end blood cancers. So LLS provides support, education, financial resources uh, to patients, families, caregivers, and friends of, of patients dealing with blood cancers. A cancer diagnosis is really stressful, and the clinical trial landscape is really complicated and hard to understand and so we really wanna to try to ease that burden for the patients and their families. Currently, there really is no centralized system to, to help patients enroll in clinical trials. So Leukemia and Lymphoma Society set up the Clinical Trial Support Center, or CTSC, to help with some of these obstacles for patients. The Clinical Trial Support Center, or CTSC, is a free phone service staffed by nurse navigators who are specially trained nurses and nurse practitioners we maintain intense education on ongoing treatments for blood cancers, including precision medicine, stem cell transplantation, CAR T cell therapy, and everything that's really new and, and upcoming. We work in collaboration with the patients and their healthcare teams and really try to educate and empower patients to get as much information as they can about their diagnosis and their treatment options. The Clinical Trial Support Center worked with over 750 patients in the past year. Since 2017, there have been 59 FDA approvals for blood cancers, and LLS has helped advance 52 of them. When we're looking for trials for a specific patient, we take into account their diagnosis, tumor profile, treatment history, their personal health history, their financial situation, their insurance, their geography. Sometimes you have to travel for clinical trials. If the patient and the doctor feel that a clinical trial is the right step for them, we can continue to assist them in the enrollment process. A clinical trial may not always be appropriate for our patients. We encourage them to have a conversation with their doctor to discuss these trials to make sure that this is the right avenue at the right time. It is very edifying to speak with patients now that are on the drugs that I uh, tried in clinical trial. I was a very small part of this research that is now benefiting them and keeping them alive. Been very active online in uh, cancer support forums. I've addressed patient groups at uh, cancer seminars. For those who are a little hesitant to enter into a trial, chances are you will benefit from it in some way. I've been in four trials. I think I benefited from them. For more information on the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's Clinical Trial Support Center, visit lls.org forward slash navigation. And of course, you can always visit our website at thebalancingact.com. Thanks for joining us on a special edition of The Balancing Act, Behind the Mystery. And remember to head to our Facebook page and our website and follow us on Twitter. And you know what you got to do. Make sure you stay safe out there. We'll see you next time.